Hey there, welcome to day 21. In this one, we're gonna be talking all about the Twitter API. Now, in earlier days, I actually talked about using Selenium to automate things in Instagram. And that's because Instagram's API is a little bit more locked down. It's limited to what things you can automate. Twitter's API is not like that. Twitter's API is a lot more open, but a lot more challenging to get authenticated. Now, that actually becomes a non-issue once we use the Python package used TweetPy. TweetPy actually makes it really easy to authenticate for your own application or for individual users using even a pin code. So we can actually authenticate a user without having a web API system, which we'll see in this one as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now to use Twitter's API, we actually have to get approval from them. Perhaps this will change in the future and perhaps we can do a number of things without getting full approval, but we certainly need to get full approval to do a lot of the amazing things that the Twitter API does. So that's where we actually need to start. And this actually takes a few days, maybe even a couple weeks to get a approved application. So let's go ahead and do that very, very first. Developer.twitter.com is where you're gonna wanna go. And of course, I'm gonna assume that you already have a Twitter user account. If you don't have one, just go ahead and grab one. Uh, and you can have, as, of course, as many Twitter user accounts as you'd like. And then in the right-hand side, I have mine saying CFE teaching team. We're gonna wanna go into apps. Now, another way to do this is to go to developer.twitter.com slash your language. In my case, it's English, so en slash apps. This is another way to just go directly into creating your first application. So when you go to create an app, it's gonna ask you for a bunch of details, a description, and a website. So you're gonna probably wanna have some sort of website, even if it's a GitHub re repository, that's okay. Um, it's just, you need to have some sort of website that references what this app is. But the main thing here is saying how this app's gonna be used. This is only for Twitter employees. This is where they approve it. Um, as a student, you can say, I'm a student. I'm just learning how to do this on CFE. I told them that I, that's what I'm doing. I'm teaching you how to use this. And that's how this one was approved. Um, so you're definitely gonna wanna do that now. Once you get it approved, come back to this video. Uh, it's certainly possible that once you actually have an application, even if it's not approved, you might be able to have these keys and tokens because that's what we need to have. We need to have the API key and secret key to actually move to the next part. Um, so if you do see these things after creating your app, that's good. That doesn't always mean that your app has permission to do anything though. The next thing is making sure that you have read and write permission here. If you don't have read and write permission, that's another thing that you'll need to get approval for most likely. Now, this is certainly very frustrating if you're wanting to just dive in and actually build some applications. Now, for me, I was actually able to go through a older application and make some changes to that. And then I got approval on another, another um, username, but I, I actually just didn't do that. I, I went through an old application that was approved a long time ago. So the other thing about this is if you get approval for an application, there's a really good chance that you can change it later. I think the main part of this is uh, security and making sure that there's not too many spam things out there because that's certainly not what we wanna be doing. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that you have an application going forward with those keys. Of course, you can watch how I do a lot of these things if you don't have an application already, but I think the real benefit is actually having that application and going through it with me on your own application. Now jump it into VS Code. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new folder here for day 21. And in my terminal window, I'm gonna CD into day 21. And it's probably no surprise, I'm gonna go ahead and do pip env install. And we're gonna be using TweePy with Python 3.8. So that's the main thing that we'll need to use here. I actually wanna have Jupyter Notebooks in there as well. So we'll go ahead and run that. Um, the reason I do Jupyter Notebooks all the time is for the interactivity. So uh, let's go ahead and pip env install Jupyter as well. So while that's installing, we can look at the TweePy documentation here. So TweePy.org and clicking read the docs. This will take you through the documentation. So the first thing that we're gonna do, of course, is the actual authentication. And looking through their documentation, <laughs> It's really easy to do, uh, but there is one piece that I think is important for us to look at, and that is actually not having a callback URL. So typically when you use a social networks API, 
like Twitter or like Facebook, like Instagram, um, you typically have to have your own production web application to actually integrate with it and to get users from it, right? So a few days ago, we did the Spotify API and that Spotify API was only about the music. It had nothing to do with the end user because that one required a callback to a live functioning URL uh, and a live functioning web application. Now, in earlier days, we did something called ingrok, and you could totally use that on a lot of these callback URLs. But luckily for us, the Twitter API doesn't need that. So let's go ahead and start our pipmv shell, and then I'll go ahead and do pipmv, or rather, let's go ahead and do Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so this is going to open up my Jupyter Notebook here, and I'm going to make my first notebook. And I'm just going to call this the API client. And first things first, I'm going to go ahead and import TweePy. I'm going to go ahead and import web browser. See this in just a second. So web browser is built into Jupyter itself. It's not like Selenium. So we're also going to import time. Now the first thing I need to grab is the consumer key and then the consumer secret. Okay, so these things... Um, are very, very common for APIs. So you think of them in terms of like your username and password. So going into, you know, developer.twitter.com and the apps, we click on our app, go to details, keys and tokens, and the consumer API keys are what we need. We actually don't need to worry about the access token or access token secret. These things are for app only token secrets, right? So uh, instead of using a user, you could use these tokens, but we actually want to use a user. So let's go ahead and grab this first one as the API key. And this one we're going to actually call the consumer key, right? So yet again, it's called the consumer API keys. So we just kind of said consumer key, and then the next one's going to be consumer secret key. So let's go ahead and copy that one. And or consumer secret works as well. Okay, so standard things, we got our username and password essentially. Uh, and now what we need to actually declare is our callback URI or uniform resource indicator. Um, this is actually going to be something called OOB. So typically that would be a URL, like, you know, something like uh, cfe.sh slash Twitter slash callback. And that URL would actually handle the next pieces of this. Um, but we actually don't need to do that. We actually can use OOB. And then with that, we just going to call auth and it's auth handler. If you don't know what OAuth is, I'll show you in just a second. We go into the consumer key and then the consumer secret. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and use that callback URI or URL if you had a web application. Okay, so what OAuth is, is it's a type of authentication that requires a user to log in to the service that it's trying to log into. So like in our case, it's going to be logging into Twitter. Uh, but in many other cases, it's not going to be logging into Twitter. It's going to be logging into another service. OAuth is a standardized way of doing that. There's another one called OAuth 2, which is not what we're, cop or what we're doing here. We're doing OAuth 1. Um, that is cause for confusion from time to time. Uh, but just, just keep in mind that this is actually how we do it. And of course, this is all coming from the TweetPy, or rather not TweetPy, but TweetPy um, library itself. And also the Twitter API also has this same information. Okay, so now we've got our auth here. So we initialize the OAuth handler. So what we need to do is actually grab our redirect URL. And there's going to be auth.get authorization URL. Okay, so this is going to authenticate our application and grab a URL that I can send my user to. That's what this redirect URL is for. Uh, so I hit enter and there we go. Next, what I can do is use the web browser. So web browser dot open that actual URL. Now, before I even do that, I'm actually going to try and print out this redirect URL, as in I'm going to rerun this cell again, and I get this error, right? So we actually have to do this all in sort of one step, right? So I need to actually grab the token and then grab that redirect URL. I hit it, 
and then it gives me this URL here. So this is the URL I need to open. Now, of course, I can actually open it by default anyway, or I can use the web browser, open call, and we hit enter. That actually takes me to this web browser, right? So you see I'm logged in as a user. It's asking to authorize access to my account and look at all the things it's wanting to do for me. So uh, certainly it makes sense why they have such a lockdown on third-party applications, right? It's, it's gonna do everything. You can delete uh, lists, you can delete tweets, you can follow people, you can do everything here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and authorize this application, of course, and here is my pin, right? So this pin, I'm actually gonna come back into this API client and use it. So this user pin, I actually wanna grab as user input. So I'll go ahead and say user pin input equals to, well, the built-in function of input. This will give us a prompt to our user, whether it's in Jupyter or just regular Python, it will give us a prompt to our user, kind of like a form field that on a web application, and we'll just say, what's the pin value? Question mark and put a little space there, hit enter, and now it's asking me for what the pin value is. I put this value in, I hit enter, that value is now associated to this user pin input, right? Uh, so that's a really cool way to add some user uh, interface to grab, you know, things that change. Like in this case, the pin value will certainly change. Uh, but of course, the cool thing about this as well is assuming that I wanted to share these keys with you, I could send this exact same thing to you and you would be able to log in to my account as well. But typically web applications do you know, everything up to even this URL. So like a real web application would have this key coming in and just send the user this token or this URL. The, that user would go to that URL and then grab the pen and get that pen. And then from there, then all we need to do is say auth.get access token. And this is for the user I don't know why I did user pint, but <laughs> user pin, uh, we go ahead and hit enter. And these give me the access keys for that particular user. Now these access keys don't actually change, right? So let's, um, I didn't mean to remove that. Let's see if I can actually grab them real quick with print auth uh, access uh, token and then auth.access token secret. I'm hoping that exception didn't uh, cause an issue here. Okay, so here's my keys. So let's try that one more time. I'm gonna run it and it opens this up, authorize this app, get my token uh, pin here, call the input again. What's the pin value? New pin value, whoops. And now we go into the next cell here, new pin value. I run this again uh, and notice that the token, the access token and the access token secret uh, are the same, right? So I actually didn't change it. Uh, the only way they would actually change is, well, there's a couple ways on how they could change. Number one is if you change your consumer key and your consumer secret, that will actually require these tokens to change. Uh, so if you go into the developer account and hit regenerate here, all of those old user tokens are not gonna be valid anymore and you're gonna have to have them re-authenticate, which is something that's not uncommon to do, right? So it's not uncommon to have to re-authenticate with a service, as I'm sure you're well aware. Whenever you log in with a service like Twitter, if you do the Twitter login with any sort of web application, it, it actually does that re-authentication often, but you just don't realize it because it's not usually that you have input. It's not usually as a user, you're typing in a pin. It's usually has a callback where it does all of that stuff automatically but we don't have a web location, so it's really cool that Twitter made the ability for us to even put in this pin, um, which is just another reason to like their API. Okay, so the next thing is, uh, I wanna get data about my own personal user, the user I just logged into. So API equals to twipy.api, and now we pass in that auth key here. Uh, once I do this, I actually have access to everything that's in the twipy API, which is pretty much everything for the user. So looking in that documentation again, if you if you see the API reference down here for TweePy, uh, this is what we can do. We can do every single thing in here, home timeline, uh, statuses lookup, you can create a new status, which is tweeting. 
Uh, you can use, look at a user's timeline as in, you know, the, like all their tweets, most recent status posted from uh, the authenticated user or a specific user. Uh, so the first thing I'm just going to go ahead and do is just say me equals to api.me and hit enter. And then I'll go ahead and print out me dot under screen underscore name and then hit enter. There's my screen name. Not super riveting, and it's hilarious that it's still called a screen name, not a username. Screen name just reminds me of AOL Instant Messenger from like 20 years ago. Uh, but it's, it, you know, that's what they call it screen underscore name. So, yeah, that is some of the basics of actually authenticating with this. And of course, I want to break each little section into its own chunks, like actually doing a tweet. So, let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so let's go ahead and close out this API client that we had going here and back into our home page. I'm going to actually rename this to one auth, like authentication, and then I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it. And we'll call this one update status or maybe update status, a.k.a tweet. Now, I think this is probably what you'll end up doing most, right? Actually tweeting on your user's behalf, right? Because even if this application only automates your tweeting, that's cool, right? It doesn't have to do a whole lot for everybody else. It could just literally automate your tweeting. Okay, so what we need to do, of course, is just run through this again. Let's Go ahead and open up that browser window, authorize this application, grab that pin, close out the other ones, and put my new pin value in here. Let's make sure we actually put it in there. We see that new value, we get the same exact tokens, right? And then I've got me and me.username.screening. Okay, so how do I actually send a message? Well, it's simple. It's API update status. And I can say, hello world from the, you know, 30 days of Python at join CFE. What up? Okay, so this is my new status. Go ahead and hit enter. And well, how do I know something happened? Well, first and foremost, I can go into Twitter and literally there it is. Pretty cool, right? So definitely hit me up. Like that would be awesome to see what you've got going on. So I can also go ahead and just say new status dot destroy. And that deletes it. So it gives me a bunch of data about that object, which you could see by just instead of going through all this, you could do dir and hit new status. And this will give you all of the attributes to that particular status. Right, so you could call any of these things and figure out what it is that they are. I'll let you play around with that. Uh, it's pretty cool. Now, the documentation for TweePy also goes into this a little bit, uh, but I've always found it really easy to just type out dir, and that actually gives me all of the data I usually need, regardless of what package I'm using. Um, so, oftentimes the underscore things we can ignore, and all these others are kind of where it's interesting. Okay, so the next thing is probably actually passing through with an image of some kind. So like actually showing this image going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick screenshot. By all means, feel free to grab whatever image you'd like. I'm gonna do like a little square here with that update status thing. And I'm gonna bring this into this project. So into dev 30 days of Python day 21. And then I'll open up another window and desktop. And the screenshot that we just did was this one. So I'll go ahead and say image.png. And there's the image. So now to actually upload that image, well, I could check the docs, but I'm going to use that same dir again. So dir of the API, right? So again, the API is like the root of it. So again, the API is when you log in right here. So we get an object from this, that object we can call dir on. And that will give me all sorts of options here, which is really cool. So if we scroll 
kind of to the top, we see that we've got create friendship. That's also known as following. And so you can follow somebody. That doesn't mean they'll follow you back, but you can initialize it. And I think that same API name uh, is kind of remnants of what Twitter used to be back in the day when it was starting out. Um, so it probably would be create follow if it was made today is the point. And you can d delete those following right from the username itself. Uh, you can see friends, you can see followers. This is stuff that we'll, we'll definitely look at. Uh, but what I want to do is actually upload some media here, right? So the media being that image that I just created. So I'm going to go ahead and say IMG object as in media uh, image object, right? We will do API dot media upload. And then the image that I was using, which this can be a path to that image. You can actually open up the image file itself and pass that as well. Uh, the raw bytes, I believe, but I'm just going to go ahead and grab the local path. So it's image.png, which the reason it's that is because I'm right next to that same, you know, Python notebook here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. That actually uploads an object for me. If I do dir of the image object, I'll see a number of attributes of this, right? So we've got the media ID string. This is something else that I actually want. And it's very similar to my earlier tweet, which was this, right? So I come in here now and I pass in this update status. And now I can say media IDs and I can actually pass in, you know, the ID that's coming from this image object or few different IDs. I think it's five. It might be more than that, uh, but let's go ahead and just use this one. So image object and I'll use media ID string. Okay, so we hit enter. And of course this gives me another status. So I can go back into Twitter to check that new status out. And what do you know? So now I actually have text in here with the image, right? So that's pretty cool. So we're starting to see like, hey, this is actually uh, a pretty robust API as it is. Uh, so again, I can actually destroy that. So let's actually go into this URL here uh, for my actual profile. And I see that, yeah, that recent tweet is there, but the one right before it is not. So again, I can actually destroy this status as well. Or you can leave it if you want to let me see it. I hit destroy and refresh on this page and it's gone. All right, so if you stop now, you would have enough to automate all of your tweets. The trick would be to actually create like a hundred tweets that you want to have for the next however long and have them being tweeted out on a specific schedule. Maybe less time than that, maybe more often. I don't know. But the point is that you can now automate how you do all of your tweeting, which is, I think, really cool. And of course, the actually updating of tweets themselves or the status items themselves, um, they're all just status objects, especially when you're using TweetPie, you get these status objects back and you can run all sorts of methods on them. So of course, by all means, go ahead and do DIR of any given status and you can see all of the different methods that are in there. And also note, look at how many items are in this data itself. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going on just with one single tweet, which is like amazing that it has that much data in it already beyond just the simple you know, text here. Um, so of course we wanna explore a little bit more about this Twitter API, so let's keep going. So now what I wanna do is actually get my timeline. That is when you log into Twitter, you have a timeline of things that are suggested to you. And this isn't exactly the same thing as a feed. The feed would probably be more in linear order based off of time. The timeline is a lot more you know, suggested by Twitter. And we also wanna grab a timeline from any given user, right? So the user that you actually end up selecting doesn't matter. It's much more about the different timelines here. And what you are gonna to wanna to do is actually duplicate the second notebook. And all I did was turn it all into one cell. I ran the authentication and now I can actually call um, you know, my stuff here. So if I did me dot screen name, oops, screen. I should get my actual screen name there. Okay, I just took those steps off because they are redundant, very redundant at this point. 
So to get my timeline, I'm going to go ahead and use my timeline as the variable. And this is going to be a list of status items or tweets, right? So uh, we just call API.my or rather home underscore timeline. And that's going to give me a list of items here, which we can see by printing it out. Okay. Not too, not too shabby. Um, and of course I can actually iterate through each one of those by saying something like for status in my timeline and I can print out the status dot text. Okay. So that's actually showing me a lot of that same information. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Now, what I actually want to do is not just get this raw text out. What I want to do is turn this into a pandas data frame. So it's a lot easier to actually analyze. So I'm going to go ahead and import pandas as PD. Now, of course, if you don't have pandas installed, let's go ahead and make sure you do with pip install pandas. Now, naturally, I would actually use pip EMV typically, but in this case, I actually didn't have pandas installed. So good thing that I checked that. And now I've got pandas here. So what I want to do is iterate through all of these status items and turn them into a pandas data frame so I can save them as a CSV file. Now I'm just using pandas as a quick way to save things as a CSV file. I actually don't need to do a whole lot with pandas itself at this point, but it will set you up for future because pandas will be how you analyze a lot of data and Twitter gives you a lot of data. Okay, cool. Uh, so how do I actually do that? Now, typically what I do is whenever I iterate through something that I don't know what's in the each iteration, right? So like if I'm guessing this, I can run print dir on it. I can also do something called vars and the actual iteration object. And this will give you a lot of data here. So if I do vars, it actually turns it into a dictionary. This doesn't work every single time, but uh, when it does work, it gives you a lot of really good data in here. So this is actually a dictionary itself. Let's go ahead and try that out by just getting the type of each one of those things. And there we go. So we have a dictionary that's a Python dictionary. Since we have a Python dictionary, I can actually say my keys are equal to, well, that dictionary dot keys. Okay, so now I can do 4K in keys, 4K, uh, for the, you know, the variable K in keys. And I print that out. I actually don't need this statement here. And this will give me all of those keys. Okay, so I'm actually gonna use these as my column titles. So I'll go ahead and say columns, and I'm gonna equal it to a set. Now, the reason I use it as a set versus a list is because sets can only have one of something, right? So if I used a list, I could definitely append each one of these Ks, but eventually it's gonna have way too many, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just say columns dot add K. So now when I look at columns, let's go ahead and get rid of this print statement here. And I look at columns at the end. I see all of that data there, right? It's in a dictionary itself or a set actually. So we can call list on it and that actually turns all of that into a list. So that's going to actually be my final columns. So I'll call these header calls and it's going to be a list of all of these column items. Okay. Of course, you're probably wondering why the heck am I doing that? Well, the big reason is to use pandas uh, data frame and we need to pass in some sort of data here. So I'm going to go ahead and say my tweets data and then I'll go ahead and use my columns and those columns are going to be in relation to whatever these header columns are. Okay, so now that I've got that partially done. Um, what I want to do is actually ensure that the data type that's coming through on these columns is one that I actually want to work with. In other words, the actual accepted types. Let's go ahead and say that I want to have a few allowed data types. So we'll go ahead and say allowed types equals to the string and integer data types. That's it. Like those are the only data types that I actually want to have. So then what that means is in here, what I want to get is the key value pair. So the V data type, the value data type being the type of, well, um, we would actually grab uh, the dictionary data, which would be this right here. So I'm going to go ahead and call this the status dict and we'll actually declare it as a dictionary value. 
Okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and grab the type for that iteration. So each iteration in there, I'm going to grab what that type is. And then I'll just say if V type in allowed types, then I'll go ahead and add it to the columns. And I'll also say my data or I called it tweets data. I'm going to go ahead and put my tweets data here. And then since I'm still iterating through those keys, I'll go ahead and say single tweet data is an empty dictionary. This empty dictionary is going to be equal to that key value pair. So K being the first one equals to, you know, whatever that value is. And this should actually not be a string, but rather the argument itself, the iteration argument like that iteration variable. Okay, so now I've got that. And then after I iterate through all of those items, I'll go ahead and say the tweets data dot append that data. Okay, so now what I should see after this is if I insert a cell above, I should get some tweets data in here. And it's just a list of dictionary items that are inside of these allowed data types. Now it's possible that we get a, a uh, exception here. I've actually seen that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do a try block and accept V type is none, just to be safe on that one. So if the V type is in there, so if none's in there, which it's not, um, then we would actually go ahead and do that. But I'll just make it a little bit more explicit and say if V type not equal to none, then we'll go ahead and add those columns in and everything. Okay, so now that we've got this, I've got my tweets data, come down a little bit, and I've got my data frame now that I can use with that, and df.head, we hit enter, and what do you know? So this data is giving me a lot of good information, right? So it's giving me the source of each one of these status, the status ID, retweet count, uh, there's a favorite count in there as well. Uh, but one of the challenges, I actually don't see the user or the username who actually owns this tweet. Surely I can look it up, uh, but I might want to actually have this on that data frame as well. Uh, so to do this, the first thing that I want to do is actually look at the headers I'm actually using. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a cell above this tweets data and enter this out. And nothing related to the user is in there, right? And if I actually go into my status items and print each one and print out, let's just try status.user. Uh, and what I get is, well, I get a user object, okay? So that means that my user object, I should be able to call screen name. And sure enough, I can. Uh, so that's cool. So that also means that in here, in my single tweet data here, I can come in and say user, and then add in this username here. Okay, there is another one called author. Author should also be considered in here. So author and status author screen name. Those should be the exact same thing, uh, but let's just bring it in just in case. The columns themselves, well, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I add in those two as well. So uh, real simple, I'm just going to use header columns down here and then I'll append user and author okay let's run that again um, now my header columns should have user and author sure enough they do my tweets data is still the same but now it has user and author in there and we can go a little bit further and now take a look and there we go so we have our user and our author and again it's the exact same thing but the author the nice thing about that is that's a little bit more descriptive than just user i i think at least um, so we'll leave that in just as is, uh, but this is really nice because it's giving us a data frame. But what I want to do is actually convert some sort of list here, this whole thing into just returning back a data frame uh, so I can use it with other types of users. So I'll come to the very bottom and we're going to define extract timeline as DF, not Tim line, but timeline. And we'll go ahead and do a timeline uh, list. Okay, so we paste this whole thing in there. 
And we've got our timeline list. That's this right here. I called it Timline up there. That's funny. Uh, I'm calling it Timline Everywhere. <laughs> okay. So now I've got this timeline list here. So what I can do is obviously grab the data frame itself. I don't actually need the head item here. I can just return the data frame. And then in theory, I'll be able to actually use that exact same thing all over again and just pass this one argument in here. Okay, not the Tim line, but the timeline. Okay, so let's go ahead and try it. And I'll run this. So there's my timeline. And I'll call it DF2. So DF2 equals to that. And we'll grab that. And we'll go ahead and print out df2.head, hit enter. And it's actually printing out all those usernames and whatnot. We actually obviously do not need those things. So let's get rid of them. Let's try that again. And there you go. So that's the same exact data frame, but it's now a function itself that we can call on any given user. Now, of course, the reason I actually did this has to do more with a another user, like actually being able to extract another user's timeline. Now, to do this, we can simply just say user equals to api.get user. And you can use any user you want. I'm going to go ahead and stick with VS Code, a really, really nice, you know, modern web application, <laughs> as they say. Anyways, so we can now grab all of this user's timeline by saying code or well, let's say user timeline equals to user dot timeline. Not timeline. What is going on there? Okay. And now we can do df3 equals to this extraction function and use that user timeline and df3.head, hit enter, and there you go. So it's giving us these source items here. Uh, this is actually potentially really interesting for analysis across many different users. What are they using to actually tweet? Um, and TweetDeck is something that this particular user is using a few times, but it's also using the web app and so on. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And now I can actually go further with this, of course, and save it as this particular user's feed or their timeline. And I could run this on a regular basis. So if I had it actually hooked in somewhere, I would totally be able to run this and it should be fine. Now, if you start to have millions of users or maybe even thousands of users that you're calling on a regular basis, um, you, you're probably gonna run into timeout issues as in throttling, that's probably gonna happen. Uh, but at least for the very, purpose of what we've done here. This I think is really interesting and useful. Uh, I, I'm certainly leaving out all sorts of data, but with the Twitter API, I can use what we've got here to actually grab additional items. And I could also remove items from here as well. Uh, I don't think it's necessary at this point, but it is really cool that the TweetPie API makes all of this that much easier. So you might be wondering, is there a way to actually automate retweeting, to automate favoriting or liking something? Um, you absolutely can. And it's all done with the Twitter API using TweetPie. So go ahead and duplicate the third notebook that we just created, mainly for the authentication stuff. Uh, so we've got up here exactly the same authentication. In my case, I'm already authenticated. I already ran through this. And we wanna grab a specific user and their timeline. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to grab an individual tweet. So I'm just grabbing any individual tweet. You can just click on one and that will give you a username, a status, and then the tweet itself. Um, so you can always grab things that way as well. In other words, to actually grab a status object, we would use api.get status of the ID. And the ID is gonna be in the URL itself. So if you click on, let's say for instance, this one, the March release of VS Code is out. I can grab that ID right there, copy that, bring that into this get status call. And this will actually give me that status object. So I can do status object.txt. And what do you know, there it is.
Okay, so how do I actually interact with any given set of subjects? So it doesn't actually matter if it's from the user timeline itself or from a status object itself. To get a status object from the user timeline, the individual one, well, you can actually grab the status object ID and you could say, this user timeline is a list of things. So of course we can do dot zero and then we can just grab dot ID. And if I print that out, it gives me the status object ID. Um, and if I want the actual URL for that, so the status object URL, as in the URL that's actually live, um, it's really just in this format here. So simple enough, we can paste it in here as a string. So the F string in here, this is gonna be that username. So status object screen name, let's go ahead and use their, the way they define it. And then of course that's the user, or rather uh, the user timeline object the set of subject ID here, and then it's going to be dot user dot screen underscore name. And there we go. So now we have all of the items that we need in here. So screen name is this, and then the ID is going to be that. And sure enough, we can print out whatever that value is. And this is true on any stat status object itself. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to grab the status object ID, but rather the status object itself. So user timeline status object equals two. And there we go. And that's probably a little bit better. And of course it doesn't have screen name. It has screen name and there we go. Okay, so that should give us that status object ID. And if we open it up, uh, sure enough, there it is. Right, so this is from VS Code. This is likely gonna be their retweet of that, uh, but you could get all that information from the object itself. So the status, the user timeline status object, you could grab that, or you can actually do a lookup for that status object, which is cool. Okay, so now let's actually like one of these things. So it's actually pretty easy. First and foremost, if I wanna retweet something, I just grab whatever that ID is. So let's go ahead and grab this status object ID. And all I do is api.retweet and pass in whatever object ID I'm using, status object ID, I hit enter and there it retweets it. So I can check this out by going into my user's account, right? And taking a look at my retweets and there it is, right? So I just retweeted this exact same thing and you know, I could remove it as well. And you just go ahead and click on undo retweet and that removes it. Um, so I can actually go ahead and do one more thing, and that is liking something. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and comment this out, and I'll run this again. I got this status ID here, and for now, I actually don't have it liked, right? So the heart is not lit up. So if you like something, it's a, it's a red heart. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and actually like this thing. Uh, the way it's actually called is a favorite. So I'm going to go ahead and just say... API, let's uh, run this little cell here. So API and create favorite and grab any given ID. So again, I'll use that status object ID because that's the URL I was using. I hit create favorite. And now if I look at that single tweet, refresh in there, uh, there it is. I actually liked it. And the opposite of this, is probably no surprise given how this API is and that's simply destroy favorite. Uh, we don't want to call both of these at the same time. And there we go. And sure enough, if I go back back into that tweet, I see that I've now unliked it. Okay. And now I want to actually show you the last thing that you can do with tweets and their specific IDs. Let's go ahead and reply to a tweet that VS Code actually did tweet itself. So this one right here, uh, from May 4th, I'm gonna go ahead and click on it and it should give me this status ID here. We're gonna copy this and bring it back into our API call. And so I'll go ahead and call this my reply. Now in this case, I actually want the reply so I can build the direct URL like I did here. I want that exact same thing. So to reply to something, it's still API update status. And you might say like, wow, this is cool. And then you can actually pass in the ID that you're using. And this almost seems like it should work, but 
one thing that you should and have to do with Twitter is actually add in the username that you want. Um, so in my case, that username, I'll go ahead and say uh, OG tweet equals to, well, let's actually grab the tweet itself. So it makes sense to just grab the tweet object. So we're using it, using TweetPy. So before I retweet that status, I'll go ahead and do API and get status of that item there. Okay, so I should be able to see the username. So OG user dot screen name and OG tweet dot, well, I could use the ID again if I wanted to, uh, but there's the screen name. So I bring in my reply now with that original tweet screen name and that original tweets ID. And now I can go ahead and reply to that specific tweet. So I hit enter. And of course my reply, I need to print out my reply.id. And of course I could say my reply.user.screen name. And I see that it's, you know, obviously my user. So naturally I could, you know, generate that URL again from that same thing. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to go into Twitter and then my username, which was join CFE status, and then that tweet. And there we go. And it says replying to at code. Uh, so that's actually a reply to that individual tweet. Um, so this is best serve when you actually reply to the original tweet author, not necessarily who's retweeting it. That's at least been my experience. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, that's how we can like things. We can, you know, retweet them or reply to them, which are, I think, the main items that you end up using. Now, every tweet itself can do exactly what you would do on Twitter itself, right? So I added at code on there and it replied to it by default, but I could also add in those hashtags and whatnot as well, uh, which is pretty cool, I think. So uh, let me know if you have any questions on this interacting part. Um, I think at this point, we now have a really solid basis for automating all of Twitter, um, except for one thing, and that's actually following other people. Right, so let's go ahead and automate the process of following users. Now this is actually really simple, but first thing I need to do is actually duplicate our previous notebook so that I have all of the authentication stuff and make sure you do the authentication and then finally have a user, right? So the cool thing about this is I can also see what follower count this user has. So followers count and also who they follow or the number of people they follow. In this case, it's user and friends count, okay? So friends count is whom they follow. It's not called following, it's called friends, okay? So with this, this will be criteria I'll use to actually find various users. So I can actually follow the same users that VS Code follows by saying, let's say user friends equals to user dot friends. And that will give me some of this user's friends, which we can see length of user friends. Okay, so it's only giving me 20 of them. Uh, there is a way to adjust that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but now that I've got this, I can actually come in here and say for user and friends. I'll go ahead and say friend and user friends. And I can actually print out friend screen name. And of course it's screen name, screen name. And there's all of, the, or a few of the people that this particular user follows. So I can actually use the same criteria and we can say something like, if friend dot followers count is greater than, I don't know, 300, then we can go ahead and print out that username. Okay, so there's a few in there that are greater than 300. And so now if I want my user to follow one of these, really simple, it's just api.create friendship of all of these users, okay? Now, I'm actually not gonna do that just yet. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I wanna make sure that their follower count's high, but then their friends count is low. So then I'll go ahead and say, and, 
friend.friends count is less than, I don't know, 300. Because if they're following a lot of people, then perhaps it's a sort of bot account like what we're building, um, where they just follow a ton of people and they don't have that many followers, or they just follow a ton of people and a ton of people follow them back, um, which sometimes is true. But what I've found is the vast majority of them <laughs> don't have that. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say relationship equals to that. And I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'll go ahead and say my new friends. And I'll have this in as an empty list. And I'll just append that same name. So my new friends append friend that screen name. Now there's a reason for this, which we want to actually unfollow these people in just a moment. So I run that and I may or may not have any new friends. I don't know because I haven't checked this and it looks like I do. So I've got a few of them in there. Uh, Python VS code I actually want to keep. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop that or let's just go up to negative one and we will not use that one go so these are the ones i want to remove so we'll say to remove and it's my new friends and now for username end to remove api dot destroy friendship username and of course i want to call that and sure enough that actually removes them from there now we could obviously verify that on our user account but it definitely does. And that's a way to automate these following of users along with some sort of, you know, criteria in order for me to actually follow them. And after you follow them, of course, you can look up their stuff, retweet things, like things, comment on things, and you can do all of this stuff automatically, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now, and also a little scary, I would say, because it's like anyone has access to do this, so what's actually going on on Twitter? Uh, but anyway, so now that we've got this, there is still another piece that we want to solve, and that's gonna be the last piece on this series, and that is actually seeing you know, more than 20 friends. Now, it's nice that I can see 20, but I wanna actually iterate through a lot of them, so let's go ahead and do that in just a moment. All right, so before we get started, let's go ahead and actually duplicate our previous notebook and we're gonna just rename it items and pagination with TweetPie cursor. And of course, um, I wanna just make sure that I'm authenticated. So if I run api.me, I actually grab that, that user that I'm authenticated as. Okay, so now what we wanna actually accomplish with this one is to be able to get more items from an API request. Now, in previous ones, we didn't get that many items back especially when we were looking at like our home timeline, right? So the api.home timeline or the user timeline, either one, we actually didn't get that much stuff back. So home timeline, we usually got only a few things back here, right? It wasn't super long. So if I actually go into the length here and I look at that, I'll see that I get 20 items back. Now I can actually augment this by giving a higher count. I think there actually is a maximum count uh, but when I do count of 40, it, it only gives me 38. So it's not necessarily going to give me every single thing back, uh, which is why we use the TweePy cursor. So it's actually pretty simple. I'm going to go ahead and say for status in TweePy.cursor. And then we actually pass in the API call that we want to use and then any other arguments. So in this case, I had a count of 50 in here. I can pass that in or I can just leave it out. And then I can call dot items and the number of items I want to return. In this case, I'm going to return 50. Now I can actually print out the status dot text, of course. Uh, but what I actually want to do is wrap this in one more aspect, and that is going to be enumerate. So enumerate will give me the iteration that it's on. So this will be now I comma status. Hopefully you know that by now. But when I run that, I go for 50 items. I start at zero, so the zeroth iteration, and then I go all the way down to 49. Uh, so that's cool. So that means that I'm actually getting the amount of items that I've wanted here. Now, if I go too high with this, rate limiting is gonna kick in. And this is a very common thing across all sorts of APIs. So you don't overload their system or you do anything sort of spam wise, right? So number one, overloading the system. If there were no rate limits, you could have several different machines doing 
millions upon millions of requests at a time and that would overload their servers. They don't want that to happen. So they rate limit on a per user or per application basis, right? So if your application is doing too much, it's gonna rate limit you. If you're doing too much for one user, it's gonna rate limit you for that particular user uh, and their specific token. So they're 15 minute rate limit windows, which is really nice uh, in some sense, it's kind of long, but in other sense that we have the TweePy API actually will allow us to wait for this to happen. In other words, if we actually look at the API reference in TweePy, we get this argument in here that says wait on rate limit. So if you actually pass this in to your API and you say true, uh, what's gonna happen is if you break the rate limit, if you go over whatever that limit is, the threshold, uh, then this will just wait. It'll just sit there and block this, the application and it will not run until you finish it which is pretty cool. I think that's actually very, very useful uh, for all sorts of reasons. So if I passed in, you know, 500 in here, it's a really good chance that I'm not actually gonna get 500 items. But if I do pass in 500, I'm gonna wanna give this a, a much higher count. Now I actually don't know what the exact highest number count is, but I'll put in one in there and then I would run something like 500, right? Uh, I'm not gonna do that because I don't actually wanna hit that rate limit while I'm recording, but I definitely did in my own tests. And you might've already too, just playing around with the API itself. Uh, but that's actually how we can handle it going forward. Okay, so that's cool for our own API timeline. How about another user? Well, let's go ahead and say that. So other user, and I'm just gonna go ahead and use The Rock. I think he's a cool guy. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring some more attention to him like he doesn't already have it. Uh, so for I and status in enumerate again, and this time it's tweepy.cursor and api.user underscore timeline. And then the screen name, of course, is going to be the other user. Okay, and then again, I'm gonna do items, and this time I'll just do 20, and then I'll go ahead and print out, I'm just gonna print out I just to make sure I'm getting the correct iterations. And of course it's not Timline. No idea why I keep on making that typo, but I do. Anyway, so there's 20 iterations. And again, if we ran it again, I do, I'm gonna go ahead and do status.txt. That is another API call right there. Um, so that is important to know that I actually did call it again. Now, now that I've got this, I have a more robust way to actually just call through all of these things. But you might be wondering how and what do I actually pass in to the cursor? Well, this will take some trial and error, but also in the API reference, if you actually look at any of the API calls that you can make, a lot of them will actually have either a page item, right? So page here, so the number of pages, that is really game for using a cursor. Um, a, a single detail item, like a status lookup item, one single item, it's not gonna necessarily need a cursor, but more than likely if it has a list, you can probably pass it through. So if it returns a list, there's a really good chance that you'll be able to pass that through a cursor and get the things that you need to get. But every time I've seen page, I, the cursor works really well. Uh, so that's also pretty cool. Count is another item that you can see and actually call that. So when I say call it, I mean you just call API mentions timeline or API retweets of me, right? So that's the things that you can go ahead and call inside of that cursor. And of course, just trial and error makes sense. Now, one of the things that you can't do is let's go ahead and say the rock user, and that was api.getUser and other user. So I actually can't call uh, the other user. Like I can't call a cursor on this at this point, right? So whatever this instance is, any of the methods in here, I'm actually not able to call the cursor on it. Uh, all of those methods, like such as friends, for example, all of those methods can be used just directly with the API and passing the other user's information itself. Uh, so in other words, let's go ahead and take a look at how I would use a cursor to get the rocks friends or followers count. So to do this, we would actually use the cursor for api.friends. Let's go ahead and take a look in the reference. So you got friendship methods, okay? So we got friends IDs, okay? So this is actually how you would call the friends of any given username or their user ID. So let's go ahead and just do it. 
and I'm gonna just run, so it's for I and underscore ID. This time it's an actual ID that's coming back for this. And we'll go ahead and enumerate this. And again, it's twepy.cursor. And it's api.friends ID. And then screen name equals to other user. And then we want to call items at the very end of it. And I'll go ahead and limit this to just 30 items. And I'll go ahead and print I and underscore ID. And we've got API has no attribute friends ID. Of course not. Friends IDs. We run that. And this gives me all of the IDs. So when I say that, I can actually run this API call then and actually grab any one of these IDs, right? So um, another way to do this would be just say my, or the rocks friends, and then just, you know, pin them. It's not the only way to do it, but we'll do it this way. So then I can go ahead and grab api.get user and the rocks friends zero, and then we can do dot screen name. And this is how I would actually grab all of that friends screen names right from that actual list of IDs. Uh, so that's cool. Now that I've got that, um, what we just need to do is actually use a search call. So searching tweets is not actually that hard. So I can search usernames and I can also search tweets, the statuses themselves. So let's actually do the statuses first. So I'm gonna go ahead and say query and I'm just gonna do hashtag Django. So I'm looking for any tweet, recent tweet, with the query of Django. So you can actually use the call of API search and pass in the query here. This is one way to do it, uh, but I actually like using the cursor for this method uh, so that it gives me all of the pagination things that I might need. So if I want multiple pages of it, I can. We haven't done the pagination yet, I realize, but um, we can also have items itself. So again, I'll go ahead and do for i comma status in enumerate. And again, it's twee.cursor, api.search, oops, let's spell cursor correct, api.search, and then the query itself, so q equals to that query. And then we can actually give a items back per, uh, per page if we want, but I'm gonna leave it in, out for a moment. I'll just give my most recent 50 items. And now I'm gonna go ahead and print i and status text. Okay, so um, pretty cool. We've got a lot of things like Django in here. Uh, it's showing me everything that I might need for any given item. So I got status, maybe I'm gonna grab status author dot screen name as well. Uh, screen name, <laughs> silly, okay. Uh, so that gives me the screen name and then the actual text that they're tweeting with any given you know hashtag, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is a nice way to like follow up with various items that you might want to follow uh, and then like kind of categorize them on your own and then review them later just as one long ticket. Uh, the other thing is perhaps you want to remove things. So let's say, for instance, I want to remove jQuery from this, right? So once I remove jQuery, it actually gives me much different items in here. Another thing is you can remove a specific user, right? One that especially seems like it might be spam. Like, let's go ahead and just say that this is spam. I'm not sure if it is or not, but let's go ahead and run that. And uh, this is actually looking only in that user or that it has that user rather. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a minus there and it's gonna remove from that user. That's one thing. And perhaps you also wanna, you know, like maybe remove another kind of user or maybe bootstrap, get rid of that in there too. So another minus, and that will actually start to narrow down uh, the choices that you have there. And then, you know, maybe if discounts in there, perhaps you don't want that either because that, you know, that might be spam. It probably is spam of some kind, realistically. Uh, but there we go. So we've got a bunch of really cool things going on here as far as the search is concerned. Um, so now we just need to take this one step further and we'll go ahead and do query username. And in this case, I'm going to say Django again. So all the usernames for Django. This time I'm just gonna go ahead and copy and paste that original API search here. 
and we'll paste in here. The search itself is just a little bit different. It's now search users and we can still do that query and we can also pass in a per page item here, like how many users you want to come back per page. And this time is no longer a status item, but rather a user item. So we can actually see what the username is. So we're gonna go ahead and run that. And there we go. So we've got a number of things in here with the name of Django inside of that screen name. So uh, right now it's actually iterating through the exact same thing over and over again, it looks like. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this per page thing here and run it again. And now I don't, th uh, it looks like I'm still repeating things. So perhaps it doesn't actually have that many items with the different names or for some reason it's do just doing a re repeat. Not exactly sure why it's doing that. Uh, but of course, if you actually want to get rid of these things, I can do search results being equal to a set. And then you can just add in into these search results, uh, add user.screen name, and then you can print out uh, the list version of search results. And that will give you all of the unique ones in there, uh, which is significantly less, it appears. Uh, and that might be just for that specific username, but realistically, are you gonna be searching through hundreds of usernames? Probably not. More than likely, you'll, you'll be using the status one a lot more uh, than anything else. And then finally, actually using pagination. Now, pagination itself is gonna work on all of these different methods. I just wanted to show you a few different ways on how you could go about actually doing a cursor call with various API methods that are in here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the one we just did. And now I'm gonna turn this into using pages. So I'm gonna go ahead and just give three pages and then we'll go ahead and do per page equals to 10. Okay, uh, so this time I'm gonna get rid of that search results thing here and this as well. So now what we do is we actually pass in a page through the iteration. So what that means is the page itself is going to have the list in there. So in the documentation, it has something called process page and it just takes in whatever that page is. So we make a function to handle that and that is gonna be process page and that's gonna be page results. That's essentially what's going on here. And then in this case, I know that my page results are actual user items. So I can say for, well, I can do I and user in enumerate and my page results. And now I can go ahead and print out I user.screen name. And then down here, I'm gonna just go ahead and print I and page like the page itself. Okay. And query username, let's go ahead and say the rock again. I hit enter and, and it's the wrong query. Whoops, I used the wrong query on both of these. That's probably part of the challenge there as I used the wrong query in two places. Uh, so now that I've got that, I'm still getting re repetitive queries in there, but go ahead and try the rock here and hit enter. And this time, you know, it gives you the, probably the most accurate result for any given user first and then it gives you all of these other ones uh, that may or may not be the accurate results either, um, which is okay. I mean, it's possible that this is just too many items for you to actually search for on any given API search. Um, so that's, that's something that's kind of cool that we can do an API search for the username or the user itself. And then we can just go ahead and use pagination for multiple pages. So the final thing is just one more rate limiting example. And that is if you didn't do the rate limit from the API call way up here, if you had this off, which would be just false, I'm gonna leave it in as true just so you can just run this. But if you did leave that as false, you might wanna have a custom way of handling this rate limiting. A good example of this would be if there was a rate limit, you would actually send an email or some sort of web hook to your application saying, hey, it was rate limited at this time for whatever this query is. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is just say, define the limit handled 
This is coming directly from the documentation inside of their uh, code snippets, just so you know. Uh, but I just wanted to explain it as we went through. So this one's gonna now pass in the cursor. So I'm not gonna actually enumerate the cursor this time. And I'll just go ahead and say while true, which means every single time, no matter what, I'm gonna try and return or yield the cursor, the next value of that cursor. And if the exception that is called, which would be limit error, then we'll go ahead and do time.sleep and we want to sleep for 15 minutes. So sleep is in seconds. So we did 15 times 60. So that of course is 15 minutes is equal to 15 times 60 seconds. And of course, since I have time.sleep in there, we're going to go ahead and import time. Now this is actually where you could send an email or webhook wherever you might need it okay to, to just alert it or to log the fact you also yeah you can also log it um, log the fact that hey you went over the rate limit and you can start to track how often you're going over that rate limit because it certainly could happen um, oops this should be yield like that okay so to use this we actually pass in for i'm going to use for follower in limit handled and now i actually pass in that cursor so it's twepy dot cursor api dot followers so this is going to be my logged in users followers and then dot items and i can go ahead and print out the follower uh, screen name okay uh, so now that I've got this, I just run that and oops, not tweet pie, but tweet pie. Uh, I'll get all those followers in there. So uh, it also will with the cursor, it's not going to load them all at once, right? So if you just leave it as dot items, it's going to just slowly load all them. But eventually, if you have enough followers on this particular user, eventually you're going to hit that time limit and it's going to start to sleep for literally 15 minutes. So in my case, I actually might have to have it sleep for 15 minutes. I can interrupt it, but the API is still being rate limited, right? So it doesn't actually matter if I have it sleeping or not. The API is still rate limited, so that's one thing. But this is certainly another way to handle when you do hit rate limiting, like you probably will hit uh, 15 minutes or the amount of things that you can actually do for a lookup for any given user is not that much, right? They don't actually want you to just dominate every piece of data that they have. Uh, but it is really nice that we have the ability to handle those rate limits right inside of TweePy. Um, all right, so that's it. Thanks so much for watching day 21. Hopefully you got a lot out of this. And what my hope for you with TweePy is to actually integrate at least parts of the Twitter API into your project where it makes sense, right? So like if you're posting a new blog post, it would make sense to just automatically tweet that or to tweet it at people that might be subscribed to your application with Twitter. Like if they logged in with Twitter, you might be able to actually go directly to them and tweet them, say, hey, check out my new blog post, stuff like that. Uh, so there are certainly things that we didn't cover like direct message methods, uh, but I think that now you have enough of the fundamentals of using TweetPie, probably more than enough to just go into their documentation and do the things that you're wanting to do. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.